listeners, and welcome to the Dreadclaw. <laughs> Hello, Ben. Hello, can we go back into a drop board, please? Do, this place do, it doesn't work quite. Two peas in a Dreadclaw. <laughs> no? no. Welcome to no. the drop pod, everybody. <laughs> Strap on your harnesses, because we are going to war. So tonight, um, very excited. Uh, we have some cool stuff to talk about. So on the hobby desk tonight, Ben's been working on some Necromunda. He's been working on some Oryx. And I've done absolutely nothing, which is excellent. <laughs> then, though, we go into the Galaxy of War. Um, again, cool stuff to talk about in the Galaxy War. We got chapter approved. Um, some great stuff in White Dwarf this month. Um, yeah, there's some good stuff, isn't there, dude? Yeah, loads, yeah, loads of great, great stuff, stuff, man. Um, and I've been listening to some audiobooks. Don't forget Necromunda. I haven't. Heard, I've mentioned Necromunda. It's all good. It's all good. Into the Mortal Realms, then, guys. So, um, really good battle report in White Dwarf this month, which was pretty ace. And we had a recommendation from Josh in Games Workshop. Um, to listen to Hammerhall and other stories so a little bit about that because I've finished listening to that one we then go into Hail to the Community so got some cool stuff to talk about in there for you guys and then finally Into the Wilds and we got some rather awesome models that Ben and I have kindly been sent so we'll start talking about those we haven't quite got on to actually painting them yet but we'll talk a little bit about first impressions and that's us so as ever grab your refreshments guys Thank you for joining us, and we will see you on the Hobby Desk. Hi guys, and welcome to episode 13's Hobby Desk. Um, Dan has been attempting not to do any hobby this week, and he's he's managed to... uh, almost get his hobby desk uh, ready to go but um <laughs> other than that we've got a few other things to talk about um cuz over the weekend we had the golden demon um we'd like to talk a little bit about that one with Dan. yeah it's um as ever pretty spectacular i know you've been sharing some of the stuff um is is a lot of that on the games workshop golden demon site ben is that where they're coming from or <laughs> No, I I follow a lot of these guys on Facebook and Instagram, so I've actually been watching a lot of them progress the model through its stages, which has been really cool. Um, it's the first time I've ever done that, really. Well, yeah, I'd imagine that's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, particularly Richard Gray. Um, he's been sharing his Death Guard um, squad on uh, on Instagram almost every stage of the way, which has been really cool to see how that's progressed. Mm. Um, yeah, so... Before we go on to the Golden Demon, though, let's talk about what we've actually been up to. So, <laughs> I've uh, I've done Wait, very what? little. You, but... I, you've not been winning Golden Demon, you mean? No, I don't think there's ever a chance of that happening. But um, I have been painting some Oryx. Been painting the uh, Shades by Oryx. Oh yeah, this I saw. Yes, really good fun, actually, dude. Love them. I am. Uh, I must admit, I'm I'm looking forward to beating the painted Oryx. How <laughs> are you? repeatedly I, with a stick I, they actually look like on paper the wall band that i'd most suited to my play style so that'd be quite cool to give them a shot i haven't actually played with them yet but i've enjoyed painting them that's what's important just idiotically so, swinging random implements <laughs> is that suited to your <laughs> that's a bit like you cooking <laughs> <laughs> it is like it's very much like me cooking or cleaning actually yeah, I don't believe that because I don't think you clean. Oh, oh, that's not saying you smell. Just that Joe is very busy. <laughs> brutal, absolutely brutal. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the only thing I've been painting because um, I've been uh, I've either been putting together Necromunda bits or um, did you or lose my piece forty seven? I didn't lose piece 47, but I damn near lost it. <laughs> it was so difficult. Did you oh, use that... tweezers? I, I did. I couldn't, I couldn't pick it up with my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> it's like ham fisted, like one of those cranes in the, in the, in malls where you're trying to pick up a toy. <laughs> like, there. Oh, yeah. don't get me started on those flipping cranes. <laughs> it was a lot like that. Mm. Um, I, Cleaning the little bit of mould line off of it was, oh, 
<laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> but it does look good when it's done. It does look good when it's done. For for those who haven't ever haven't had the pleasure of putting together the Goliaths yet, Piece Forty Seven is uh, is a cigar, um, but it's separate from the dude's mouth, and it is a, just a nightmare. <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant when it's finished, but it is very challenging. Uh, one of my well, favourite posts. You've kindly um, offered to paint my Goliaths for Christmas, so I haven't got to. I haven't got to do yeah. it. I've come up with a lovely paint scheme for you, dude. Good. Kind of pink, pink with yellow flowers. I think. Oh, I see. That's the way we're going with it, is it? <laughs> well, I don't know. Hello, Hello Kitty Goliath. <laughs> oh man, that would be amazing. That might actually happen now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, not much to talk about on my desk, but I have been pulling out like old models. But it's part of the cleaning process. Um, so if you oh, can... I saw your mummock. Yeah, my mummock. I'd completely forgotten about that, dude. Completely forgotten about that. Rob just whipped it out from like the stock cupboard a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was like, oh, you need, you need to take this away. It's been in our stock room for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, there are all sorts. There's probably like a small colony of a new life form living in the stock room of games workshop Plymouth yeah <laughs> I remember Mike's office like used to be his office out the back around the corner like you yeah. can't even get to it anymore I can't remember the last time I went out back actually wow can't remember um but yes so that that came out and it was covered in about quarter of an inch of um spray dust <laughs> 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 Which took a whole like hour to clean off properly. Did it not um, just come across as weathering? No, it was it was practically black. Oh. Yeah, so that that that's that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm a golden demon. I think it'd be worth going through some of these because I I love golden demon, mate. Really love it. Um, I've always loved it. Um, it's one of my favourite parts of the. White Dwarf is the Golden Demon Showcase. And um, uh, this month's White Dwarf has got Gareth Nichols, um, Nicholas's uh, the Librarian Terminator in it. Yeah, it's, it's just, amazing, isn't it? It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and I've followed him for a little while, and, and it's nice to hear his thoughts and the process of putting that together. Um but this this time over the weekend, the winner was um, the winner was Dave Soper's uh, Plague Marine. There's been quite a few Plague Marines. Um, not surprised really, because there's some really nice models in there. Well, and there's lots of textures, isn't there? So there's a good opportunity to show off different different painting skills, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think David is David Soper is a master of textures, um, and he's used a stippling kind of effect on the on the armor of. Um, and pastel colours on his armour, which might not be to everyone's taste, but technically it's just it's just outrageously good. <laughs> I, I like it. that he's gone for like the lighter colours. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's one of those models though where you look at it and I I can't really see what colour it actually is. As in, if I was to try and replicate the process, I I don't I don't think I'd know where to start. I'm guessing with a lighter tone and then um, working into the into the shades, but um, but that would be a guess. There's just so many different kind of subtle cut colours in there that, um, and I think that's something that I haven't even begun to explore in painting is adding in a colour that I wouldn't expect to see on a, on another colour. Cause I think when you start out painting, if you paint green, you just paint green. If you paint blue, you paint blue. Um, but that's sounding daft. But when you get better, I think when you, when I see people's models who are well in advance of me, they use other colours in blue and green. Um, to come through, especially on things like orc faces, you see like a, a range of kind of, um, of the purple kind of stuff in there. I think it looks really good. So I loved his, I love the Slayer model this this time. It's a well deserved win, I think. Absolutely. So top. was that so that showcase then? Is that from Golden Demon? Which Golden Demon was this? It's the one over the weekend with the open day. So it's the open day, right? Okay. Yeah, because yeah. I know there are there are a load of them now, aren't there? So. Yeah, so many I can't keep up. Actually, <laughs> there's a fair few over the year. 
um, that I need to sit down and get to grips with it again because I can't. Um, I really look forward to them, and I quite like to know when they're coming up. Because I guess I think I'd quite like to enter into the Golden Demon just once, and see how it went. Yeah, it would be uh, interesting. I well, I for me, I just don't think I paint a level to warrant entering. I think you can, and I think uh, so. Ben is been talking to me about entering as well. Um, ben Chambers wants to enter, and um, yeah, <laughs> we were discussing it actually because he said he said to me the other day he's like. Oh, I've not even started painting yet, and I, I, I don't now know if there's any point entering. And so, one of the things I said to him is, I think, like, if you have a desire to paint to that level, once you enter, especially if you have a presence. So Ben, is, with his with Cage Paints on Instagram, has quite a few followers. So if you've got yeah. an online presence and you make it clear what you're trying to do, you can get in. It sounds odd, but you can get in with a crowd of people that paint like that, you know, paint really, really well. And as long as you can take constructive criticism, you start to open yourself up to to pushing yourself. And I think a lot of the time you read about people say that paint to that level, you know, are thanks to so and so for pushing me that extra mile and somebody else for suggesting this and suggesting that. Yeah. So. I I think it is worth entering and starting to get yourself known on the Golden Demon circuit if you have a genuine desire to to paint to that level. But I think you, I don't know. I mean, I I'm not clearly not a Golden Demon painter, so they might disagree with me. But I would imagine that if you are looking to paint to that level, you also need to be able to accept the amount of time you're going to need to put into each miniature. Oh, definitely, absolutely. Yeah, that's a big thing, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, which goes back what... to one of the things we've always talked about in this section, which is um, when you sit down to paint the model, you have to have a really clear idea of what it is you want to achieve with it. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. certainly. You need to you need to um, think about like overall where where you want it to be at the end, I suppose, and what it's going to be part of. If it is just a single miniature for display, or whether it's part of an army. Well, amazingly, it's whatever your I mean, motivation I, is, isn't it? I would never paint a golden demon entry that I would use in an army. But one of the guys that I featured on our page, um, Bill Doran, his um, his Zinch Greater Demon, um, he, he's using that in his army. <laughs> it's like amazing. Uh, <laughs> well, I suppose if you're going to put the hours in, yeah, I think I would like be scared to touch it. So I really want, um, interestingly talking about painting games workshop put up um the heavy metal painting classes didn't they and they sold out like in- instantly um, literally instantly <laughs> yeah and I, yeah. I know we were talking about going and it would be cool and and i'm sure it'd be a great weekend but i was thinking i'd really like them to do one with like um mark bedford for example and people and or like people who are part of the army team so like chris peach did stuff with the army painters, didn't he? So, yeah, and learn how to create good stuff really fast. Yeah, yeah, you know, because that's my my hobby ambition is is to have large collections painted yeah. well. Um, so yeah. I'd love it if they did a weekend like that. You know, just come up and paint. I don't know a thousand points in a weekend, something like that. It'd be great. Yeah, <laughs> thousand points in a weekend. Okay. <laughs> I reckon it can be done. Just do um, Army of the Dead. Yeah. Yes. Ooh. Very easy to do Army of the Dead. So one of the things that um, I had almost forgotten to talk about, actually, is um, Marcus, who's one of the guys who goes to the Bobbin Club, was talking about how he used to have a painting night like once a week with a couple of guys um, and how they used to be really cool because it swap, I swap ideas, swap techniques push each other a little bit um so i've um i've sort of set up a regular painting night around my house for the guys at the club um i had a first one last tuesday and it was really successful um <laughs> i got told like literally the most epically sad story i've ever heard to do with painting a model um so you know marcus uh won the golden demon a while back yes well he won it with that titan yeah well 
back then, um, you took your golden demon entry to the local games workshop and then they would curry it, courier it to the Birmingham event. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So there would be a kind of pre- preliminary f- stage at the games workshop. Um, so his got sent up to Birmingham. It obviously won. Um, and it came back down again and somebody, the courier realized that, um, he was transporting a golden demon winner and uh, opened it to have a look, dropped it on the floor, and then stood on it and slipped on it like a banana. So it got <laughs> abs- <laughs> it really? got absolutely yeah, it got absolutely ruined. That sounds um, like something off, like a comedy show. Yeah, but, but it's not funny. Really, but um, no, really <laughs> just the fact comedy. that he not only did he drop it, but then managed to stand on it. Yeah. But um, he, Marcus was showing me a couple of the models he'd used to test out ideas for it, which was a really cool thing because, um, um, and I'll pop a few of the photographs up of those on the on the show notes, which you can find on our website, guys. Um, it, they're really cool. They're like, for example, he's done a Chaos Lord, and he's done the shoulder pad with the, the piled skulls that he did as part of the um, as part of the model that he entered into the Golden Demon. So, Esrus. It's just a re- it's a really cool process to see, and I wonder if other people sort of try out an idea on a on a test model to see whether they like it for the real thing. Um, I guess they do. <laughs> I guess I guess some people don't, but um, I suspect it's that's... probably quite individual, isn't it? Depending on yeah what you fancy doing. But it was it was really it was they were quite cool models, so I'll, I'll share share the pics of those. So that's um that's something I'm looking forward to carrying on and. Um, it's quite nice actually, because sometimes, sometimes painting can be a lonely hobby. Um, and I normally fill that time listening to podcasts or chatting to you on the phone. Um, <laughs> but sometimes it's nice to have people in the room and showing each other stuff and going, Oh, how are you doing that? Or, um, cause me and Marcus are completely different painters. He literally cannot paint a model without blending it. Hmm. Um, whereas I'm like the, the exact opposite. I just, have a kind of idea what I want the model to be for and then paint to that level. Um, so the only time I'm blending or taking my time with it really is, um, if it's a character model, but well, it's very interesting. The so only that's kind cool. of like blending I do is when I'm cooking a cake <laughs> to be quite honest. <laughs> that's just a personal preference, but I do I completely agree with you with the painting evenings thing. I love that stuff. I really like that. And actually so much so that where I'm building the, where I'm setting up all the hobby space, I've put two painting areas in mainly because then I can have people, someone come around and do painting. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, cause I think it's cool. I think it really think is cool to share the hobby like that. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly if you've got something flipping boring to get through. <laughs> You can get someone to come round while you're highlighting blood letter three hundred and seventy four, <laughs> or Goblin fifty. <laughs> yeah, or Goblin. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got no sympathy for you painting blood letters. If well, I, I'm of... very sympathetic to your plight with goblins, mate. I really uh, <laughs> feel for you. So, when are you going to switch across to doing the Nurgle? So, um. I think I said last time that all the demon stuff is with um, a chap who's painting it up for me uh, yeah. to finish that off. So I've got the two Forge Fiends, the Land Raider, and some HQs, and a Helldrake. So once I recommission Hobbyland and I actually start getting a paintbrush back out, because I've realised I haven't painted, I haven't even put paint on a brush for about four weeks. I said to Harry, I'd be lucky if I remember which end to use um, of the brush once <laughs> I get back to it. Um, she laughed and then I promptly stabbed myself in the eye with a pen. Um, showing my <laughs> motor skills are fine as ever. Um, so I've got that and that, that's got to be done really um i really Mm. need to push through that because there's some good stuff in there to help the army can't to be honest it can't hinder it because it can't get worse um and there's a (laughs) couple of nice modeling projects like the land raider that need to be finished once Mm. those things are done that will mean all of the corn models i own for warhammer 40,000 are painted 
Um, yeah. Unless I buy any more in the meantime. And then it's then it's next project. So Nurgle are very high up the list, as are Zinch, to be honest. Um, but so is Terrain. So I really want to move on and do some Terrain. You and I were discussing just yeah. how many banks we'd need to rob to create the, the Board of Awesome for Necromunda. Um, not as many <laughs> as we expected, but still quite a few. So I'd really like to do that. And on that, on talking about... Um, painting stuff quickly uh on warhammer tv they featured uh how they painted some of the sector mechanicum stuff yeah essentially using spray cans <laughs> yeah and and it was fantastic and also i didn't realize how modular they were so when i saw the video that duncan did of like putting it together um i was like this is amazing this is like warhammer lego um so yeah i'm very keen to do some of that so I, yeah I don't know is the is the short answer to your question, but I thought I'd give a bit more of a picture because after all, we are a podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I don't just want to give simple answers. Okay. Well, I look, I look forward, I think, to seeing the pus monsters. Yeah, um, but it might not be. It might be the psychic power badasses. Uh, yeah, but then I just enjoy killing those. Yeah, I, to be honest, mate, I am seriously tempted to collect them just to come and slap you around the face with the codex. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not going to play you because I'll probably lose, but I might just turn up at your house with the codex and whack you. <laughs> <laughs> well, or yeah, might sneak get in codex. in the night and cover you. No, I, do you know, I was going to say sneak in the night and cover you in blue body paint, but that just seems so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> not talk about that <laughs> and on that bombshell <laughs> i think we should go to the galaxy of war <laughs> just so we could insert a pause and i can think about what i've just said <laughs> oh dear right then guys well thank you for listening to that random moment and uh, we will see you in the galaxy of war <laughs> <laughs>
they're cavalry. They're not an infantry unit. Are they? Oh, is it any infantry unit? Yeah. Oh, no. Well, scouts can do it anyway. So you, you're talking about you're talking about grey hunters or blood claws or intercept. Nah. I'll have to ponder on it. And I'm not I'm not blown away at the first the first reading. Um I have to say. I do absolutely love um True Grit though, and that's Ace. That for me really does um fit with the Space Wolves. Yeah. Well, yeah, I agree. It's great. It's it, well, cuz they used to have something called True Grit, didn't they? So I like that they've done that. And I also like that cuz the other thing they've got in here that they used to have is the um I think it's Saga of the Warrior. Yeah. Born. <laughs> I hope they do sagas again when they actually get round to doing them properly and not just in in chapter approved. Yeah, me too. Me too. I mean, there's a lot to be hopeful for because um, I mean, slightly moving off chapter approved and into the Blood Angels, but the fact that the Blood Angels now have access to everything is is really cool because um, I'm hoping that that'll come across to. The, the space walls as well because there's some things that i really would really like to have access to um you're gonna have to excuse me for forgetting the names but the small flying gunship that the, that the space moons have um help me out dan is it the storm hawk i don't know i've made that up Oof. storm, storm talon, talon is the other one the little one with the i know which one you yeah mean. well that one i expect everybody knows which <laughs> apart one from me except for us <laughs> well that one i like the idea of that in a space wolf army you know that it just seems like the sort of thing that they would have um but you can't have it but they don't like flying well, some of them don't like flying and they don't like flying in jump packs slightly different oh, okay. and then if you read the um the fenris campaign books that you, know, you can read about a company of space wolves who absolutely love flying around in jump packs so i think it's just you know, each to their own, to be honest. But that I'm really excited about. That I'm really excited about. Ha <laughs> ha! Dude, I just found something out amazing. In- accidentally, right? So I went on the Games Workshop website, okay, to look up what that thing was called. Yeah. But somehow, because I'm a bit ham-fisted, and to be honest, the iPad, I think, reacts to my um, Cornish roots uh, and chooses not to work. Um I ended up clicking on Space Wolves and Best Sellers, right? Yeah. There are none. <laughs> there are no best sellers for Space Wolves because people know they're rubbish. <laughs> this is brilliant. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> oh, Thanks, Dan. Yeah. I just threw that out there. <laughs> well, hopefully they won't be so rubbish when their codex comes out. I also found out that I was right. It's the Stormhawk Interceptor. Yeah, that one. Yeah. It was just under the bit that said there are no bestsellers for Space Wolves. Uh, I wish we hadn't decided that we... So, interestingly, though, talking about Space Wolves, I have been listening to um, the Lehman Russ Primark novel. Oh, yeah? It's really cool. Yeah, I really want to read it, actually. <clears throat> it, it's, it's very cool because um, it does that thing where... It basically, it starts out and then it becomes a reflection and it's set about that story about when Russ and uh, the lion oh, yeah. end up attacking the same place. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, famous one. So I don't want to go into it too much because you're going to read it, I am. but it is very good and it is well worth, um, well worth it. So chapter approved. What do you think? Because I mean, it has been a bit controversial to say the least. Um I, I was a big fan of General's Handbook, so I was willing to give it a, a good shot before I made any criticism of it. But um, I, I haven't got mine yet. Unfortunately, it hasn't turned up in the post. Um, but you have. So what's your impressions of it, mate? Um, it's a load more ways to play, and that makes me happy. I don't know. I see. I am obviously easily excited about everything. <laughs> I know that. I know that. I know that. I, I, I love it all, but I... I think part of it is like, why would I want to get out of bed and be grumpy about anything? And I do, I do tend to apply that to most stuff, to be honest, not just Warhammer. But I'm like, if I don't like what's in it, if I don't like the points values or whatever, then I'll just do something else. But actually, it's not that big a deal. It, it just is what it is. Enjoy it for what it is. So I, um, I particularly like all the little sayings, which harkens back to sort of third edition. And they're actually, they've got the cool, I think it's Wayne England artwork, little bits on them as yeah. well. 
So that's really nice, harking back to third edition in that way. Um, I've looked a little bit at it, not loads. I like the fact that there are lots of rules in there for the scenery um, that exists. There's some updates to match play and some different scenarios. So that will in itself get people to change their their armies. And don't forget that like tournament play and stuff, often in games, and certainly like Magic, for example, companies do change the dynamic to make it different yeah, yeah. so that it doesn't stagnate and I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that it is a little odd i will grant you because of the codex situation i suppose yeah and i think that's the biggest um, issue isn't it i mean at the moment we are getting bombarded with new codexes um at a rate that i don't think well i know has never been never been the case before um but it's no different to what happened in Age of Sigmar, except that in Age of Sigmar, because they killed off the world and essentially went, boom, there are no armies except all these, like, what they're called in the new Age of Sigmar. So, um, the little faction things, yeah. It was a, yeah, it was a total, total reset, whereas that didn't happen. But I think it's a great concept. Well, also, they didn't have points. No, and that's and that's a big difference. That actually the codexes have got points in, and now there's a new book with new points in. So yeah, I don't really understand why the codexes have got points in, and I don't understand why they put points in the in the battle tomes for Age of Sigma either, because I think mm. there was an opportunity to leave the points out completely and then have the points in a compendium each year, like chapter I, approved. I saw I saw them as um as more of an appendix. As like a partial update until the next chapter approved. Mm. But I mean, the thing is, I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head for me. Is if I went to a tournament and every tournament for the next five years or until the next edition comes out, or well, there may not be another edition, there may just be updates, and it was the same meta every time, it, we'd we'd all get bored. Yeah. Of that. I I mean, um, I do like I said, I do see, I do understand that. It would be frustrating to have just purchased like your Astra Militarum Codex quite recently and then have the points change and then need to, to go out if you want to approach it in a legal way, go out and purchase this book. Yeah. And I think it would be appropriate for Games Workshop to release these points as a free download. And the reason I think yeah. that is because one of their one of the things you'll often see the community say when people say, oh, I've got to buy this book now just to get these points, is they'll say, well, actually, there's loads of other stuff in the book. And they're right, there is. Loads of great stuff in the book. And But if, if that's the point that they're going to stand by and sell, that's great. So what harm would it do putting the points out there other than please those people that, you know, it takes away one of the things that people can have a, a genuine gripe about, I think. And I think um, I think if we're being honest, those points are out there anyway. Well, yeah, they are. They are, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and are not hard to find. No, um, no so... they never will be. But generally, I don't know. Well, you know what I'm like, mate. I just can't. But what I'm, what I'm getting at by saying that, what I'm getting at by saying that is that, um, is that they're out there anyway. So it's not it's not actually any skin off of their nose to release them as an FAQ? No, no, you're right. Um, but I don't, to be honest, I don't want, really want to keep talking about the, the grumpy response no. because it, it, for me, and at the moment, it's a bit odd for me because, as you know, I haven't really engaged with much hobby for a few weeks um, and I'm looking forward to getting back to it. But once I do, there's some really cool stuff in here around missions and scenarios. And obviously, as you know, I always get rather excited about gubbins. So it did come in a fantastic cardboard box, which was good to see, <laughs> um, with a fantastic cardboard insert that holds all the gubbins, which you didn't get in the last one. So that's quite exciting. Um, and I will put pictures up because I, I've actually taken some which is good. So you've got the victory points and command points dials, which is ace, because I do forget that. And this pack, which has got the scenarios in it, which I love. Mm. I love that. I love that. And then, um, and then of course the card tokeny jobbers, which you've got. You did get the general's edition. It's worth pointing that. Yeah. Out. Yeah. You don't just get that yeah. in the book. <laughs> so, yeah, attacker and defender concealed deployment markers. Ooh, that's good. They've actually labelled it up. So they've got the nine-inch rulers that you get 
in from the Age of Sigma one as well. Firestorm attack markers, some objective markers in there. So yeah, a good mixture of stuff if you're playing lots of 40k, to be quite honest. So I really like it, obviously. So <laughs> shall we move on to um shall we move on to one of the questions that we were asked? Because um we got a few, uh, and there's one that stuck out that we both quite liked, uh, which was um what was our favourite forty K absurdity? Yeah, absolutely. That was by Tom Taylor B. Hey, Tom, yeah. So Dan, what is your favourite forty K absurdity? So for me, the most absurd thing that makes me chuckle is the warp and how they travel around the galaxy and the time effect. Yeah. It is absolutely absurd. So it's quite cool. Like when you when you hear about they they talk about don't they quite often like ah oh, you know a force might be dispatched and arrive they might think they're only in the warp for a week but arrive years after the war has already finished and actually mm. the communication through the warp as well is is really difficult and because of the time stuff it, it could be so the idea that with that being the form of travel around the massive galaxy and the form of communication around the galaxy, that you could have any kind of unified empire whatsoever is mental. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it, it, is, is it is absolutely it is. mental, really. Um, and, and obviously, a lot of the books and the background, they always focus on the, ooh, it all went wrong. You know, it's not all going to be books about the times that the fleets came in and they, everything went well and, you know. But it 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 is absurd. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. But um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's mad. So, what about you? Well, I was just going to say we we watched Event Horizon when you came down the other day. We did. Um, we watched two <laughs> films. One was good. That was Event Horizon, and one was fantastic. No, ma'am. <laughs> and, that, and that was Escape from LA. <laughs> no, dear me. But anyway, yeah, Event Horizon, <laughs> which was really cool. And that's quite a nice kind of interpretation of a similar sort of thing to the Warp, isn't it? Yes. I think, I think it's definitely not PG, but um, in my mind, that's how I would imagine a ship or the effect on a ship if it didn't go in with a getter field. Yeah, yeah, I think we said that, didn't we, when we were watching it? Um, so my favourite forty k absurdity is the shock attack gun. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it's absolutely it's just it's astonishing in every way, and it's so forty k. Um, so I don't know if, I don't even know if it's in the current orc books because I don't collect orcs and I haven't for a while. Um, but essentially what it is is a teleportation gun that opens up a portal for snotlings to, <laughs> to go wherever they want. <laughs> um, <laughs> now if you, if you get a direct hit, for example, um, I'll read it because there's some second edition tables here. So if you were firing at a dreadnought, a wraith guard or a terminator, um, on a roll of one, the leg armour is jammed with squirming snotlings, reducing the movement to half its normal rate. <laughs> or if you roll a, a five, a three to five, the snotlings materialise inside the body of the unfortunate occupant of the suit. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> it's horrendous. So, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, um, it's just so absurd, um, that it's just utterly fantastic. <laughs> this, it's definitely my favourite. The model's ace. Um, the new um, it the is new ace. Model. Oh, it's still going, is it? Well, it's been so. They had the really old model, didn't they? And then they did it, and then it went away. It wasn't in the game at all, and then it came back yeah. in metal, uh, and yeah. then and now it's plastic. Outstanding. So yeah, it's goes to show how often I've played orcs or, or played them myself. Um, I didn't, I didn't know that, but it's uh, yeah, it's definitely my favourite um, absurdity in in forty k. <laughs> Absolutely, by by a country mile, because it just it's one of those weapons which fits the personality of second edition orc certainly, um, absolutely perfectly, absolutely perfectly. I think my close second is the Harlequin kiss. Oh yeah, that's minging though we that oh, <laughs> weapon. It is at least yeah. it's quick though. Yep. So for those of you who don't know what a Harlequin kiss is, it's um, a punch weapon that penetrates a small hole in suit of armor and then deploys them. A fine wire. A monomolecular a mono thick. It's like yeah. a molecule thick wire. That thrashes around inside the armour and just utterly liquefies you. So. Yes, bad times. 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. Absolutely bad times. Don't want to be kissed by a Harlequin. No, no. So they're my two for they're my two uh, favourite absurdities. Um, I think um, I think one of the best things about the forty k is is that it is grim dark um, and it is grimy and you can relate to it in a lot of ways. But then there's just some utterly absurd things in it that, that make it almost like a um, a parody of its own darkness, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, moving on from that little section, um, I think we can't go through the 40k bit without at least talking a little bit about Necromunda. Yeah. Um, which is difficult for us, isn't it? Because we've both got it. Both absolutely loved unpacking it. We managed to do that um, in the same room this time. Um, I think the box contents are just fantastic. I have to say, right, it's... I'm sorry to cut you off as ever, but... No, you're not. That trip you never are. down to see you was flipping epic. <laughs> and I have to give a shout out to Jo, your wife Jo, because I was... Blo- she catered for me the whole time we were, I was there. She cooked dinner, which was amazing. She cleaned up while we opened Necromunda and got really excited. And the next flip morning, there were pancakes. For goodness sakes. Yeah. It was... It, so I just have to throw that in there because that, you know... Peas on the road. That is the kind of roadie we need. <laughs> so thank you, Joe. Because <laughs> that was awesome. So, yeah, we we loved the contents of the box, didn't we? Not as much the as them pancakes. Fantastic. No, I'm trying not to turn this episode into another foodie episode. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, the contents of the box was excellent. The pancakes were good. <laughs> yeah, we did love the contents <laughs> of the box. Uh, the scenery is so nice. Yeah, it's really good. Um, What's cool is the box, if you buy it separately, you get two packs of what you get in there. Yeah, yeah. That's good, isn't it? Which it's not bad at all. Um, and it, I love the fact, I love how it fits in with the old kind of um, structure, plastic structure bits. Yeah. They, it's got the same feel, same design. Um, the sprues of the models are, I know we've talked about a little bit about the Goliath ones, but oh, they are so nice. It's preposterous. Um, and all orcs coming out. I've, I said to you before that I never considered Goliaths as a as a choice for a gang. I thought that all orcs were the dullest gang out of the whole of Necromunda, and now I think they look absolutely stunning. Mm. So I'm a bit worried that they're all going to look really good, and I'm going to have to do a gang of every one of them. That would be a cry and shame. I know. I haven't got time, so I'm going to stick with one. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to cover the others. <laughs> they do look great, though, um, don't they? The Orlocks. Oh, yes. And it's all of the things that they've released. And I know some people didn't like the Beastman, but I loved that. I love the Scum. I love the Orlocks. I love the Eshon. I love the Goliath. I am so excited about seeing the, the gangs that haven't been done before, the new ones. Um, really excited about that. Yeah, that's going to be um, brilliant. I'm looking forward to things like Redemptionists. I'd like to see them. Yeah. That'll be ace. Um, so, unfortunately, we haven't played any games. I haven't played any games. In fact, no one in our club has either. So, I don't I don't know how it plays yet. So, can't really comment on that. No, we aren't always necessarily on the cutting edge of uh, reviews and et cetera as a podcast, are we? No. That's not our thing. <laughs> we just like talking about food and insulting your <laughs> space wolves. <laughs> <laughs> so, matey, um, shall we move across to um, the mortal Into realms? Into the mortal realms, yes. I think that would be wise. We shall leave this grim, dark, and plainly absurd galaxy. <laughs> Funny guy. <laughs> and move into the mortal realms. <laughs> <laughs> you tit. <laughs> See you there. Hi guys, um, we are now in the Mortal Realms. We're um, kind of following on from what we were talking about last week. Um, Josh, who is a chap who runs... Um, oh, which store is it, Dan? Warrington. Warrington. Um, he used to be one of our um, juniors when we were working in Games Workshop Plymouth. Yeah. So it's a bit weird. Just making us feel old. Yeah, very old. Best moving on from that one, I think. You are old, though, to be I fair. I feel old. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> he recommended um, Hammer Hell and other stories, because we were talking about the realms and what was going on in the realms and 
So. And the mortal point of view from it. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I promptly popped onto Black Library Audio and downloaded it. I thought it was a steal because it was 10 quid and it was 14 hours of content, which I thought was brilliant, yes. to be quite honest. Yeah. I thought that was fantastic. Um, and I listened to it on my way to and from work usually because uh, there's nothing quite like the clash of Oryx listening to that on your way into work to remind you, you know, to keep it real. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so really good. So the first story is Hammerhell and it is set in Hammerhell Gyron because Hammerhell is split across um, uh, two realms, the two realms, the realm of fire and the realm of life. So there's Hammerhell Ak- Ak- Akish, Akish, I think it's called. Or Akshi, that's what they call it. Um, and Hammerhal Gyron. So it's set in Hammerhal Gyron and it's really cool because it's two, essentially two, no, three story arcs that all come together at the end. Um, one set within Hammerhal Gyron and one set in the Hexwood, um, which is off in the distance away from the place. Um, yeah. And it incorporates, uh, the, Men and free peoples. Uh, there's a witch hunter in it, which is cool. Um, it's also got the Caradron overlords. Uh, well, there's some bits about them, reference to them. The, the Zinch stuff and Zangors are in there as well. Um, it really covers the free people actually very well. Um, there's a really good bit about that. Um, and how they view and interact with the Stormcast. Yeah. Um, which is very good. And talks a lot about the realm. Uh, and what it's like there and how it's all hot and humid and the challenges really so like they need to build stuff out of wood but they're in the realm of life where there's a certain race that doesn't really like you cutting down trees so they have to work you know <laughs> yeah. have to work around that so that's that's a really good story um alongside some other ones in there there's, there's a great one set in uh in like the realm of Nurgle and there's this guy in it and um <laughs> he's brilliant he's just made Nurgle's garden and he's just building this big garden for Nurgle and he plants corpses and lets them rot and then uses the rot to like grow his garden um and he gets really angry because some seraphon turn up and he's like no my garden don't damage my garden it's brilliant <laughs> Popsis Buell he's called is he not the guy who rides around on the snail? No, that's um, not him. Horticulous, isn't it? The guy on the snail. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Who apparently we're getting rules for in the new year in 40k. But anyway, that's Galaxy of War. But um, yeah, so I don't. thing is, it's always awkward, isn't it, when you're talking about a book? Because I really think people <laughs> should go listen to it or read it. Um, so I don't really want to talk about all of it. Hmm. For obvious reasons. But it is nice. Yeah. Um, you, oh, mate. The problem, though, is there are two. There's Overlords of the Iron Bastion, I think it's called, is one which they do an excerpt in there for. But the other one they do an excerpt for, and I can't find it. Well, I was going to get it on Audible, but I can't. So I think when I've listened to, uh, finished listening to Lehman Russ, I'm going to have to get it. It's Eight Lamentations. Oh mate, yeah, it sounds amazing. It really so it opens in Grungy's forge, yeah, and obviously Grungy is a god, uh, and it's yeah. talking about him in his forge making stuff, and and this demon comes out of the forge at him, and he basically grabs it and then forges it into like a little nugget to keep. But then he's like, right, well, who's done that then? Somebody sent that demon. Why have they sent that demon? And he work, and he sort of realizes that they're trying to stop him seeing something. So he has a look. And basically, it's the the, the eight lamentations are eight demonic, like super weapons, basically, but like axes, not like flipping nuclear bombs, um, <laughs> that that have been created. One each of the sort of forge master, corn forge master of each of the realms. And it goes yeah. on to describe three of those masters. And it's fantastic because you've got like the realm of um Chabon. Hit the one there um is like <laughs> Was that meant to be the realm of metal? Yeah. It's like <laughs> really uh it's got eight arms and he's like super 
super muscly. But then, like, the one that's from the Realm of Shadow is really wiry framed and, like, wrapped in the shadows and stuff. But he's still a corn worshipper. But I really liked that because it starts to paint that picture of the differences in yeah. the factions, but between the realms. Um, so I really like that. Oh, and, and, um, they are basically using mortals as like pawns to do things like, like they're like gods. And in Grungy's Forge, there are loads of shadows watching him and like learning off him. And it talks about lots of gods. And it really paints, starts to paint that picture that in the mortal realms, you know, that you, obviously the classic gods from the old world are or aren't there as the story dictates. But I think there's definitely, there's more godlike beings in the mortal realms, a lot more. Um, that's, that's quite interesting. Which is quite exciting. Um, I really like that. So as part of my saying earlier, wasn't I, about I really want to do scenery, I, <laughs> I really want to do scenery and try and envisage some of this mortal realm stuff. In fact, I've even put a shelf in my hobby space that I can adjust the height on it. Because if I decide to build something ridiculous that's in the mortal realms, I'll have somewhere to put it. (laughs) It could be huge. Um, You wouldn't try and do uh, a board for every realm. Oh, that would be immense, wouldn't it? It would, but I think... I think you'd really struggle to store that, and I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether. Do we you... really need a living room? That's the question. Well, I've been trying to convince Joe that the two kids can go in the tiny box room, and I can have the the spare the second room. Well, yeah, I mean but, that's um... a step up from them just being in a box, isn't it? To be fair. Yeah, but she's insisting that they have a room each, which is. <laughs> well, I just, it's ridiculous. I know. But no, I think I think that could be cool. But I think what you'd end up doing, I, I think you'd end up sort of doing all of them okay, rather than none of them properly, and none of them properly, rather than. I suppose maybe it picking depends, two. though, how you approached it. So if you were like, right, well, this year I want to create a board from each of the realms, or the danger, I suppose, would be you would start on like the realm of fire, but then get excited about the realm of metal. So you so you'd either rush the realm of fire to yeah. get to the metal, or you'd finish it. Oh, I've just thought, how cool would it be for the Realm of Metal just to get six foot by four foot of Iron Maiden album covers? That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so good. That would be amazing. Yes. That would be amazing. Metal! The thing is with those realms. Is, yeah, that's it. You could, um, you could double them up for 40k soon. To be fair easy. as well. I have to be honest at this point. I have no idea what you just said. I cut you off so much then. I said the scenery could double up as 40k scenery as well. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, it could. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Like, for example, the realm of metal, I would, I'd quite like to do like pools of um, mercury, things like that. Do you remember Um, there was a white dwarf once where they did demon worlds and one of them was Medregard, the, with iron warriors? And they made yeah. trees out of girders. Yeah. That was quite yeah. cool. But for Realm of Shadow, you see, all you really need is a dimmer switch, isn't it, in the room? Because you can have any... <laughs> uh, just turn it down a little bit. I think there's... So, you know, you just got to be inventive, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, mate, it'd be That's great. Cool. You know how you have a gaming table, don't you? At whatever height. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool to have, like, a... F- a like, create a piece of scenery. It's like a big metallic river that flows off the side of the board and then, like, down the side of the board, there's, like, another platform to mix it up a bit. Yeah, you could do. I think you're overthinking it. No, I'm not. Uh, you're underthinking it. <laughs> uh, so the other thing that. as well is you would need to have a snow option for each one because for those of you who have read your fine and mighty publication that is White Dwarf will know that in the Age of Sigma Battle Report, It's got the Mournfang in it, and they set up the board, and then they cover half of it in snow, because the Mournfang, the snow, like, follows them around. The Everwinter is always, like, chasing them, and then they have to, like, ride out of it and survive a bit longer, and then it catches them up. and So that's really cool. I like that. Yeah. Well, they're using snow snow flock through a, um, a sieve or something. 
Probably, I don't know, really. I think some of it is actual <laughs> snow pieces, and then they do that at, at the edges. Interestingly, the same white dwarf has got lots of pictures of stuff from the realms in it as well, hasn't it? Yes, which, it does. Which are really cool. It's a fantastic addition. These guns are it's amazing. Probably my, it's probably my favourite favorite one since they restarted the uh, the white dwarf, actually. Mm. So has it changed your view on the mortal realms? No. No. <laughs> is Has it made you see them from a mortal perspective in a better way? I think, to quantify what I just said, no. I really enjoyed reading about it, but very early on, and actually people only really need to this, I think possibly even listen to the first podcast we did, I really engaged with this idea of the fantastical nature of the realms. Yes. And what they would be yeah. like. I suppose what it... <laughs> I've said no, but then I suppose it. what it has done is started to talk a bit more about what it's like to be a normal dude in such a fantastical realm. Because that's what interests me. But The fantastical realm is cool. It is cool, and I like that. But I want to know how the mortals deal with it. I want to know what it's like to be my only concern, a but- butcher well, or a baker in it. Know, maybe it's not a concern. I think... It's almost so fantastical. And it's so difficult to survive as a mortal. It's a bit like 40k and having your, your standard person. It's almost an absurdity that anybody normal, as it were, survives because it's so out there. Yeah. And actually that, that for me makes it that a little bit more special because I want to know how they survive because that kind of, that kind of toil that, you know, going through that daily grind to actually carve a living out is a really quite inspiring thing to read about. Mm. And, um, of course, one of the reasons I like the Empire, perhaps more than I did Britannia, is because I felt like the Empire were under siege all the time. And they they just dealt with it in their own way. Um, yeah, I loved the Empire. And I think that's kind of what I want... That's what I... I'm, I'm going to read to help um, Hammerfall and have a, a look at it. Because I'm kind of been thinking about, as I've been going through all my old models, um, I've got quite a bit of Empire. I haven't got so much Bretonia. I did try and get some Bretonian men at arms off of eBay, but um, after about 30 seconds of looking, realised that that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> uh, they're quite expensive now. But I've been thinking of a of a kind of a story to tie them all together, and I'm. I, you can shoot this down as much as you like, and I'd quite like to hear other people's points of view on it. Um, a feedback, but I'm thinking of a place, um, where it was, it was a, a city that was quite prosperous during the time of the gods. Um, and people retreated there when chaos came. And I'm thinking of like some kind of mountain, a bit kind of Lord of the Rings esque, um, with the dwarves living in it and the elves lived there because dragons inhabited it. And, um, there was a human city at the base of it. Um, and it's now starting to sound very much like Minas Tirith, but, um, that kind of thing. And when chaos came, they kind of, everyone withdrew there. So it became a bit Helm's Deepy. So everyone from all over the place was coming there. So they ended up with a kind of almost like a refugee population. I really like that. And um, I really like that. So what I'm hoping to have is a kind of two tier system. So you'd have the actual guard which are going to be painted in cream uniforms with like a bronzy armour and shields. They're kind of going to be taken from all over order. So you're going to have Empire troops and Dwarf troops and various others uh, painted in that colour scheme. And then the refugees, so different sort of multicoloured units. And I shared you um, a unit of the Empire militia the other day. Yeah. With all the different colored trousers and clothes, just, just people that have turned up and then, um, haven't wanted to join the guard, but, um, you know, will fight when they need to, to defend the place. Yeah. Um, and then the Stormcast have come down and the Stormcast are going to be in the colors, um, that I did for the, uh, um, uh, Shadespire Stormcast. So the cream and the bronze. Um, and they're going to be the ones that inspired the kind of, you know, the resistance, the kind of, it's great though. It's really nice Second to hear like a bit of background to it, and it's it's nice doing it. It's interesting because I um we had to write a bit or put down a bit of background for our forces for um that the the uh, autumn tides that we went to recently. It's quite hard coming up with it re- like afterwards. Whereas 
I think this way is really cool because it, it will inform the decisions you make and, and the models you put in and they'll really gain some character. I, yeah. I think that's really nice. I'm hoping so. I'm hoping so. Because I quite like my order army to all be connected in one way or another. Yeah. So um, if I ever did some carriage on overlords, I'm going to imagine them kind of mooring at the top of the top of the mountain. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that amazing. Remember that board we saw, dude? Yeah, absolutely. So the mountain will be up in the clouds, and they'll be there, and um, and that way I can tie all the order together and uh, and go for it that way. I was quite excited. I've been sat working it out while I've been piddling around with my stuff. Um, and I thought, actually, that made a whole bunch of sense to me. Yeah, that sounds um, great. I think it sounds great, mate, to be honest. There you go. That... Well, we shall, we shall await seeing that develop, I think. Yeah, I think that's... You're going to add that new, that cool new Stormcast Celestant? Is he going to get in there somehow? <laughs> oh, yes, he is. I love him. <laughs> I really do. I think <laughs> there's a... Th- I'm sorry, dude. Go on. What were you going to say? I'm I'm really glad to see them doing helmetless um, Stormcast now. Yes. Because he looks so much more badass with that helmet. He looks like he's properly up for a fight. Yeah. Um, whereas the faceless thing is quite cool and intimidating, and I get why they did it. But um, Yeah, but it is very cool, them showing fit. Because one of the things it deals with... You actually... You're gonna love Ham- Hammer Howl when you when you read it, Hammer Howl and other stories, because in there there's quite a bit about the this idea of the Stormcast and the reforged ones, yeah, and how they're different. And actually, yeah. it's interesting because there's one, there's the Great Red, which is um one of the audiobooks from the Hunt for Nagash series of audios, mm-hmm. and that's in there, and um. That deals with the how a stormcast that's been reforged views a stormcast that hasn't, and how that informs their some of their decisions um, with regards to you know to choices they make on the battlefield or strategically. Um, because obviously, once they've been reforged, once they they get an inkling of what that means. Um, yeah. So that's quite good. I laughed just then because, mate, because just I... plain immortality is boring. Sorry? Plain immortality is boring. Yeah, and, and actually, in a way, right, I think it's almost more frightening what they've gone with. Yeah. Because the the warriors don't... Uh, death, I'm not trying to make light of that. I'm just saying, like, they're not just facing the fact that they'd be gone. They're, they're facing the idea that they'll be back but they won't be they'll they'll be themselves but they'll know they've lost something but they don't know what they're going to have lost and actually it makes it even it makes it i mean it's flipping terrifying isn't it you think if you if you you know you fought next to this guy all this time i suppose i'm just trying to be conscious of the fact that you know we're talking about stuff that some people might listen to and be really like you know it's touched them very personally um, Absolutely. So that's why I want to be really careful about how how I talk about it. But I think definitely, you know, it is quite a frightening concept, and it's certainly not boring immortality um, in any way. I suppose. No. On a on a no. lighter note, I have just seen a, a, the best comment I've seen recently uh, is somebody has commented <laughs> on an Age of Sigma post, and they've written that they've pointed out that Warhammer Skirmish and Path to Glory are all ideas stolen from Warhammer. And that just has made me chuckle. (laughs) Really? Yeah. Well, imagine that. Yeah, there we are. In other news, dice have got six sides. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) So we've got quite quite deep and reflective there. So shall we move on? Um, Where are we going next? Yeah. Ben? Uh, Community, mate. I know. I know. I was checking. I was testing you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's time to hail to the community, ladies and gentlemen. Get some refreshments and then join us in the Dread Claw. Welcome back, everyone. The uh, the drop pod hurtles ever onwards towards those heretics. In fact, no Xenos today. Xenos, I think. We'll have some Xenos. Anyway, <laughs> we... 
we are hailing into the community. So we got some cool stuff to talk about. Ben's got Ben um added me to a group um on Facebook that is doing some really cool stuff um around like a water planet. Is that right, Ben? Yeah. So I was I was attracted to it or drew it drew my attention. Um, you know, on the sidebar it has like groups you might be interested in. Um because of the artwork. And um I clicked on it. And the name sort of interested me as well. Um Are you are you giving the name? Ma- Mayor Solem. Um so the group is called Mayor Solem. And uh when I asked when I sort of joined the group I said, Okay, so what's all this about then? Um they described it as a as a mixture between like Waterworld forty K Yeah. Um Necromunda ish kind of thing. And it's just an absolutely wonderful little group. I've been, I've I've spent a good hour trawling back through the posts over the last sort of six months to a year, and the imagination and the thought that's gone into what the guys who are kind of leading the project are doing, but also what people are posting up as stuff that they've made for it. Yeah, it's just so cool. Boats, underwater stuff. Um, there's a lot of kind of. Did you play Bioshock? I'm aware of Bioshock very much. So. Yeah, it, there's a, there was a bit of a feel about that. I love that about it. I just I thought it was fantastic, really, and um, it's kind of inspired me to to do <laughs> some amphibious stuff myself. And um, I was thinking about how actually you don't see much amphibious warfare. At no, all. that's what I was just going to say. Yeah. It's not something that's. I know um, Henry Zhao started to explore some of it. He did a couple of books. He he was sort of it was a. Sh- Weird in a way. I, I'm, I'm sure somebody knows more than I do about it, but he did a couple of books for Black Library and then disappeared. And he, he was re- his stuff was really good. Um, but he covered off, um, some, uh, sea or maritime warfare, I suppose. But yeah, it's not done a yeah. lot, no. But there's so many aspects, isn't there? Like beach landings and underwater warfare and, cause it's perfectly plausible for a space marine to fight. On the bottom of the ocean, yeah. There's a space um, wars versus in the same way as um, they do in space. Tau battle in possibly in the last edition of the 40k rules where they engage underwater. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, I think it's absolutely fantastic, and I love the atmosphere in the group. They're all they're all really positive and helpful, um, and engaging, um, and welcomed me very quickly um, into the group. So I, I'm. That's just one of those little gems you come across when you're going around, and I think it's worth a shout out. And um, how is it actually spelt, mate? Because obviously, it's a cl- is it closed, isn't it? So you have to ask to join anyway. So it's- yeah, so I'm, I'll put the link up on the on the show notes on our website. But it's M um, A R E S O L U M. Um, I think, um, like I said, it's definitely worth going and having a look if you're interested in a kind of different take on the 40k universe because. I think what it reminded me of, Dan, was second edition and how a lot of the 40k universe hadn't really been developed yet. So it gave birth to things or it allowed people to explore it a little bit more. And I feel sometimes that things have been so well developed um, that you almost feel that there's no room for your little idea. Mm. And and I think one of the things that eighth edition did for me fluff wise by you know splitting the galaxy in half and throwing everything up in the air a little bit is actually allow you to have that kind of little idea and run yes. with it. Yes. Um, and I think it goes back to things like I've said about Warhammer Fantasy Battle that it killed itself almost to an extent. It killed create some creativity in it, particularly in the Empire. I remember trying to design an Empire army, and I was like, but I don't like any of the color schemes. But they literally had a map of the Empire with every city in the Empire, on the map. Um, and every city had its own colour scheme that was all completely laid out. In fact, there's a book called The Uniforms of the Empire, and there's literally not a single army that isn't described in it. <laughs> and it got to the point where it was like, where do I fit my little part of this universe? Because oh, some people would just go sod it and paint their guys whatever colour they want. But I find it difficult to do that because it would irritate me Yeah, um, that it wasn't one of those places. So this feels like that kind of exploration that i really quite like um it reminds me of like this i was just looking at this earlier because it made me think of it of like the crash spaceship from uh the the war games terrain book yeah, that they did yeah. um that doesn't look very 40k now 
but back then it was fantastic. It just, it was, it felt like you could, it, and like another little door had been opened. Um, and actually, one of the things that some of the writers like Dan Abner are very good is making up these classes of vessels and going, oh, there's this kind of ship, there's that kind of ship, and there's all this breadth and, and diversity. But then sometimes when you're playing the game, it feels like that diversity is stifled. There is only the Lehman Rush chassis and the Chimera chassis and all other chassis are heresy. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's massively been opened up now, hasn't it, with uh, with all the Primaris, like you say? It should. It should be opened up because books like Double Eagle, um, the whole start of the book is about how they're still using, like, jet propulsion engines like we use yeah. now to defend their planet and then the thunderbolts turn up and they're like what is this it's amazing um they they've looked at the thunderbolts like a imperial guardsman would look at a thunderhawk gunship yes um yes it so these planets have all got their own different cultures and sort of tech that isn't necessarily in line with you know the standard imperium stuff if you get what i'm saying and I, I'm, I'm rambling a bit and i know i am but Mayor Solem felt to me, or feels to me, like one of the parts of 40k that I absolutely yeah. love, which, which is someone opening a little door, stepping through it and taking a blank canvas and doing what they want with it, but still being 40k. Almost seems a shame not to, doesn't it, when you've got so much, so much you could explore. Yeah, it does. And they're writing underwater rules as well. Yeah. Which is cool. Um, so that should be yes. I'm going to keep an eye on it. I'm I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Um. I'm I'm very very excited by the modelling stuff on there. Very good. It reminds me a little bit of Blanchitsu. Oh yes. Which I yeah. I love Blanchitsu. I love Blanchitsu because when you first look at it, you're a bit like looks like a bit of a mess. Yes. <laughs> but the, but then when you look at it, the detail is phenomenal. Um, even in the paintwork, it's just beautiful. So yeah, that's Mayor Solem. Um, we were going to talk about the community survey, weren't we? A little bit. We were. So I was a bit, I rushed into my survey. I wish I'd spoken to you and, um, a couple of others before I did it. Yeah. Cause there was actually some stuff that other people had thought of to put as answers of things that they would like to see improved in particular. Um, okay. Or things they thought Games Workshop didn't Once do again. well or that. And I don't mean that like, because I'm sure, because I found it quite hard because I'm obviously always very, very excited. <laughs> um, I did put yeah. in the what would I like to see. I mentioned the stuff I said to you about painting armies effectively and quickly um, and more yes. stuff around that. Uh, but like, for example, Ben Chambers under things he thought Games Workshop didn't do so well. He talked about the quality of the casting on Forge World kits and the fact that you pay a premium price for a product that is then more challenging uh, and often not, you know, perhaps as good a quality as the plastic stuff. Um, yeah. And I thought that was a really fair comment because the Forge yeah. World stuff is beautiful, but often there's a lot of work needed. Um, oh, it's a hell of a lot of work. And yeah, you know, it's fair to say that that's the medium it is and, etc but it is being sold as a as a premium product in by a company which already markets itself as a premium creator of premium products so i thought that was a fair point yeah um but interesting to see a survey it's pretty cool isn't it i think it's i think it's really brave actually <laughs> i think it's really brave um i don't envy the people looking through that no that's a lot of work i i put do you want to hear what i put yeah so Things that I thought were irritating, though I don't remember the question that they asked, but the negative feedback I had is that I don't mind things being a set price. I know I have to save up a bit longer for them, and, and it is at the end of the day a luxury product, however you look at it. Um, but it really frustrates me in a kind of irritated way that something that is exactly the same as something else in almost every way is more expensive. Now, I can kind of get it when it's released at different times, but when you've got Mechanicum sector stuff and you've got one building that's £35 and another that's £45 and there's exactly the same number of sprues, 
and there's exactly the same bulk of plastic, and the one that's cheaper is in fact more intricate. I don't get that at all, mate. And I, and I put that as an example because that kind of thing confuses me and makes me kind of double. It's a bit odd, isn't it? Double check or have concerns about how they're actually pricing this stuff. Yeah. Um, it, it feels a little bit like someone's just gone, eh, 35. <laughs> That'll do. Roll <laughs> some dice. Uh, and so, yeah, I put that. But for things that I wanted to see, um, I talked about films. Um, so I told them to approach Netflix and I said, <laughs> every, everybody who's making this stuff out there, like the Lord Inquisitor and that fantastic Hell's Reach series, don't squash them, support them, go out there, you know, give them some funding. Cause those things are amazing. Yeah. And they bring the stories to life. And Grimaldus has never been more epic to me than when he plucked that dart out of the air that had been fired at him as if he was swatting aside a fly <laughs> and then belting the orc around the face. And the look on the orc's face, you can't write that in a book. The orc just looks like, uh, oh shit. <laughs> and I loved it. <laughs> and I think, I think for me, that would really open up the hobby. That's that little bit more. Yeah. Um, wow, I'd love to see that. That'd be amazing. I've told them to contact Netflix. Because if they do a 40k series, it's anywhere near as good as The Punisher. Um, I'm all over that. <laughs> <laughs> all over that. That'd be amazing. And Netflix, I reckon, would be up for funding it as well. Mm. So, yeah, that's the community survey. Um, I'm, you know, I'm interested to see what that actually comes out of that. Yeah. To be yeah. honest. I've convinced myself I'm going to win the 50 quid voucher. Oh, have you? Yeah, it's going to happen. I never win anything, so I, I feel that my time is, is now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I kind of... This is this is ridiculous. I'm just going to throw it. Out. I kind of hope that they get won by like people who are either just starting out in the hobby or yeah. are like really into the hobby but like 14 and 15 and for example and maybe like they got they they save up their pocket money and scrape everything yeah. together because obviously for anyone 50 pounds is, is a lot of money i'm very lucky because i have a hobby room full of miniatures and kits and things that are like were 50 quid i've got hobby to do but i do remember a time when i was about 14 where i had no hobby to do and I hadn't saved up enough to buy any hobby. So I hope it goes to... But I love the hobby. So I hope it goes to someone like that, really. As opposed to... Yeah. Not that I uh, would be terribly disappointed if I got it. But I do hope it goes to someone like that. Drives awesome. Some hobby on. So should we head into the wilds? Into too? the wilds or out to the wilds. <laughs> if it's <laughs> confusing <laughs> issue now. <laughs> right. To Cornwall. Oh, yeah. That's definitely wild. See you there, guys. Hi, guys, and uh, welcome to the wilds. I'm not quite so good at doing epic intros as Dan, so you're just going to have to settle for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... We've been really lucky to receive uh, some models from Ramshackle Miniatures, which is pretty cool. And thank you very much to those guys for sending them down to um, for us to have a look at. Um, I came in the post on Friday, and I was very excited um, and showed them around the club. Um, and you did you got some too, didn't you, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this kind of happened because a uh, chap that I work with um, New Curtis, who runs or owns Ramshackle and creates uh, their amazing stuff, um, knew him at school. So uh, when I mentioned that I did a podcast because uh, he's into to fantasy and sci-fi stuff, um, he said, you know, oh, you should speak to Curtis. Um, who And Curtis has really generously sent, sent Ben and I some models. Um, he sent me a Reebok APC, um, which is, I think really cool and it it caught my eye actually because i thought it'd be cool for necromunda yeah it's um, so nice it's uh the wheeled version uh and i i really like it i think it looks really really cool i'm looking forward to building it um certainly a solid lump of resin 
Um, is it in parts or? Yeah, it is. It is in parts. It's it is in parts. Um, so yeah, looking forward to building that up. But he's also got. I'm I'm sure it's called mini gangs. And I'm sorry, Curtis, if you're listening. Um, ben and I are are we've only just got the models. Um, and we are definitely going to be putting some time into it at the moment. Well, as you may have gathered, if you listen to the whole podcast, um, I am not getting much hobby done, but this is definitely on the list to, to get a proper look at and look at all the stuff you do. But I think mini gangs, I'm sure it's called mini gangs, um, is the Kickstarter that's recently funded. Uh, yep. so he sent us some models from that. Uh, I got, I think you got as well, some scarecrows, which I love. They're like metallic, little bit mechanicum-y esque looking dudes, aren't they? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've got a few mutants as well, so a guy with two heads and one jaw, um, some zombie looking dudes. Really cool. I like the feel of the, of the scarecrow ones. Um, particularly like the orb caster, I think he's called. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like him. I like him a lot, actually. There's so many vehicles, isn't there? Yeah. I love their vehicle range. Yeah. And their little it's kind really of cool, flying so. jet bike things really remind me of Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> One of them looks a lot like Ray's, um, so I quite like them. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very fond of that APC. I think that's stunning. Have you seen Isambard Kickass Brunel? <laughs> no, that's a model. That's a model of Curses. That's amazing. That's amazing. I'll have to put that one up. I'm gonna have to put that up. Isambard Kickass Brunel. There's little yeah. mini tanks as well, isn't there? Yeah, which is yeah. quite fun. And like... some stork tanks as well. So anybody that's a fan of, um, I know we always just move it all back to Games Workshop, but if you're a fan of uh, Gaunt's Ghosts, um, there's some, when they go, some of the forces of chaos use stalk tanks. Mm. Um, some of the, like, the fallen, well, it's not so much fallen Imperial Guard, really. It's more the the forces that are made up by the um, chaos warlords. Yeah. So, like, they're sort of general foot soldiers. But on, I think it's a dash, which is a forge world or hive world. And it's attacked by this m- nutter who just builds loads and loads of random tanks and things. And there's loads of stork tanks in that. Um, All right. People might, might enjoy that. I think, I think there's some good stuff in there. So, so yeah, really good. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it. What we'll do is we'll, we'll be getting those sort of painted up, um, sharing that. Uh, and sharing thoughts on the game as well, because it's the mini gang's rule book. Um, kindly sending us some of the rules. So yeah, really, really cool. Absolutely. Thank you. And, um, model wise, um, I think they'd be very good for a number of different things. You could use them as an alternative gang in Necromunda. You could use them in Outlands. You know, you could, I quite, I like, I think the scarecrow guys almost look like a weird kind of nuclear cult that you could use for something like Fallout as well. So. I've got lots of different uses. How is Fallout coming along, by the way? Because uh, we haven't spoken about that recently. It's doing all right. It's um, it's kind of just getting ready to release, to release actually, to launch. Um, keep seeing cool bits of scenery from um, Wasteland Warfare page, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's just kind of putting itself together, really. I don't think there's many secrets now. I think they've kind of shown their hand, um, so people are just waiting for it to come out in January, February. It's pretty exciting. I've asked for it for Ooh. my birthday. Have you? Yeah, I have. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well excited about it, dude. Um, it's, it's quality. But then, um, I really ought to paint my Alien vs. Predator stuff, but, um, before I start and fall out. Th- uh, you laugh. Maybe. You laugh, but I was, I've been very depressed, but I, I, depressed, put off by the change in scale from, um, that they did from 32 millimeter to 28 mil, right, right in the middle of like everything. Just seems ridiculous, and I have struggled to get past that a little bit. So um, I don't think I'll be collecting it anything more than the actual box game itself. Um, yeah, and a disp- as a display thing, uh, I'll paint the models up for the display thing, and and maybe get the second edition of the box set and paint that up as kind of a just to play the game. Um, because I was hoping it would turn into like a board game, not a board game, like a, a battlefield kind of thing. But uh, if they just change the scale like that. I don't know. Puts me off big time, really. Because it's, it's not like, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? Because the primaries were definitely a change in scale. But, um, there's lots of things about them which are compatible, like their weapons and their shoulder pads and their heads and all that kind of stuff. This change in scale, even the weapons are different sizes that are supposed to be the same size. Um, yeah. 
And that makes it, for me, really incongruous in that. Yeah. Anyway, that's... Um, how much had they bought out, like, before they did that? Loads. So you had uh, the Marine Squad, um, Alien Stalkers, Alien Warriors, um, Praetorian Aliens, Predators, Queen. Uh, you had um, Wayland Jutani Commandos, uh, the Walker, um, as in the Loader Machine. So what was the reason given? They moved from multi-part resin to a uh, single cast. Um, oh, right. So the whole model is one cast of resin, so you don't have to assemble it, which is a very good idea for a board game, because I haven't played the board game yet, because I've got to assemble the models. Um, whereas if they all come in one part, then you can just crack on and play it, can't you? Yes. So, so it's a good idea. Um, I guess they thought that 32 mil would be unachievable in that. I don't know. Or too expensive. But, yeah, the, the hunt... Second edition, which is the box game, is 28 mil, which is really, really frustrating. <laughs> mm. But there we are. Having said that, though, the vehicles are both 28 mil, so they fit in. But then if they did a 32 mil Cheyenne dropship, it would have been massive. Did you see that one I sent you that was like levitating with magnets? Yes, I did. It's very cool. <laughs> very, very cool. So um, just as a sort of end note... um because I don't want to finish without mentioning it, but um, the Shades of Chaos guys have um, released compilation number one, which is quite cool. Put together all of the patches that they've made on the first edition of Rulebook. Um, so you've got all of the abilities, some missions, some of the special characters, and a bunch of background in a kind of like a compendium book. So they're releasing that. So have a look out for that on their website. Um, I've been playing a campaign of that, actually. Um Still really loving the game. Um, still really interesting just sitting and listening to them decide things about the rules and where they're going with it. It's, it's kind I of particularly like... like that they're branching out into their own line of fashion. I love that t-shirt. I, I'm very, very, very close to buying one. Um, so the, the first rule of Outlands is don't be a dick. Um, and the t-shirt is, it says just that on it. <laughs> So not one I can wear to work, but um <laughs> No. But yeah, love that. Very cool. And I think there's never been a truer truer rule in wargaming, really. Rule number one, don't be a dick. <laughs> yes. Something to be considered. <laughs> right. So should we wrap this um this mental little thing up? This rambling. So uh as ever, thank you very much for listening. We're off to Cast down some Xenos um, from our Dreadclaw pod. Drop pod, obviously. Ben's threatening me. <laughs> um, he's not. He's back in Bobmin, where he belongs. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, guys. As normal, please do follow us more and more of you are, which is wonderful, on um, Twitter and Instagram. Ben will put the show notes up. He will badger me to send him stuff to go in those show notes, and I might even do so. Um, but uh, It'd be a then first. again, yeah, we don't want to break break habits, really, do we? <laughs> so um, Ben will do that because he's awesome. Please do like, share. Um, if you share it, you could win absolutely nothing, uh, but we'll be really pleased. So thank you for that. <laughs> so thank <laughs> and uh, have a great couple of weeks sorry you have to wait to hear our epic tones again but you know good things come to those who wait after all yep and don't forget we're at the two piece podcast on instagram and twitter thank you very much guys good night night guys 